You, you don't realize it. And, and I wonder if he told them, I, I wonder if, if, if that he would, uh, would talk to them about the many to come. I mean, I think about the, the Corey Ten Booms and the Martin Luthers and the Dietrich Bonhoeffers and, and all the greats that's come along through the years that have been encouraged by this story and others like it. And you know, I wonder what they might have said to the fourth man in the furnace. I gotta believe that that day they worshiped like they've never worshiped before. I gotta believe that they poured out adoration and love. I gotta believe that, that, that Jesus pulled them in close and they got to whisper in his ear how much they loved him and how much they, they, they appreciated him and how much they thanked God. And I just bet they worshiped like they had never worshiped before. You know, they came to that place planning on withholding worship from a false God, but they ended up worshiping the true God Amen. like they had never worshiped him before. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. The furnace looked like the end of their lives, but it ended up being the greatest day of their life. Amen. Praise God. Isn't that great? It turned into the greatest day of their life. And, here, and here's the news for you. God is still needing people in the furnace. Amen. Now, sometimes God delivers people from the furnace. But most of the time, he just meets them in the furnace. I, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you, there's sometimes God's going to come and help you avoid some painful situation. But most of the time, he's just going to meet you in the pain. He's just going to meet you in the hardship. He's going to say, what are you worried about? You're not going through that by yourself. I'm going to go through that with you. And I'm going to help you bear it. You see, these three Hebrew young men, I, there's no doubt in my mind that they had hoped to be delivered from the furnace. But God decided to deliver them in the furnace. And I think Jesus is saying the same thing to people today that he said to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And that he has said to martyrs over the centuries. And that he's saying to Christians right now all over the world where it's illegal to even worship Jesus. They live in the furnace. He's saying the same thing to you and I. Don't try to avoid the furnace. I'll leave you in the furnace. Amen. The furnace is the place where full surrender leads. It's where it leads. It looks scary and it looks dangerous and it looks painful, but man, it's where Jesus is. And you know what that makes it? It makes it the safest place in the world. The safest place in the world. The safest place to be. Look at verse 26. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace. You know, it doesn't tell us how long they were in there. I would like to have known. I, I bet Neb was just puzzled by this. I wondered, what am I going to do now? I mean, he, he's lost total control. He's out of options. These guys aren't dead. They're having a worship service in the furnace, and it ain't to his God. Verse 26, he, he approached them and he, he, he shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the most high. Servants of the most, servants of high. I don't know, servants of the most high God. Something's going on with this guy. Come out. And so they came out of the fire. Wouldn't you have loved to have seen that? Man, I, I would just, I, I wish I, I wish somebody would record it. <laughs> Man, I would like to have seen that. I mean, can you just see the king looking into the door of that furnace and all of his royal advisors all crowd around him with puzzled looks on their face and, and the satrap and the governors and the royal advisors and, and they saw that the fire had not singed one hair on their head. You understand? that They, they saw that there, there, there was no smell of fire or smoke on their clothes. I mean, I think they could still smell the cologne they were wearing that morning. And look at verse 28. Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted him and defied the king's command. Who's he talking about right there? Who's the king? Him! <laughs> I'm praising these guys. Man, this guy, man, he's had a turnaround. Something's going on with him. I mean, I want you to understand something about Neb. He is ruthless. He is a ruthless dictator. He has no regard for life. He doesn't care. 
This man killed soldiers just moments before that threw these guys in the fire and it did not even register with him. And now he has congratulated them for having the audacity to defy his command. Uh, look at the next verse. Therefore, he says, I decree that the people of any nation or language who says anything about the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut to pieces in their houses, burned to piles of rubble. Uh, he's still got a ways to go to the compassion department, but something's going on in this guy's life. I mean, he goes from bow down to the idol to, hey, if you don't bow down to their God, we're burning your house down. <laughs> I'm sure Shadrach, Meshach was like, no, no, King, that's not how this works. But anyway, you, you get the idea. I mean, King Nebuchadnezzar's not really a, he's not a, he's not a Bill of Rights kind of guy. You know, he's not a freedom of worship kind of guy. That's not, that's not who he is. But you see what happens next? The king ends up promoting. They come defying his authority. And now he's promoting them to greater positions in Babylon. Yeah. He promotes them. He doesn't just restore them. He gives them more. Don't you love it when God does that? Don't you love it? You know, I wonder what the rest, I got to wonder what the rest of their lives were like. We don't know. That's the only time they're mentioned in Scripture. Uh, we don't know. Uh, what, what the, I wonder, I wonder, you know what I think? I think these guys remain friends for the rest of their lives. I think they got together every year on the anniversary of this day and threw a party. And, and as the years passed, their wives and their children and their grandkids, you know what I think? I think they kept those old robes they got thrown in the fire in that day. I think their wives probably tried to get rid of them at a yard sale. You know, the balls were eating holes in them. And, and they said, oh, no, 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 not that robe. <laughs> That's the furnace robe. Uh, you know, I bet, these, I bet these guys put those robes on every year at the anniversary of this day at the cookout and marched around telling the grandkids the story of the day that they had a divine encounter with Jesus. The day that looked like it was going to be the last day of their life. And they're saying, kids, it was the best day of our life. We met Jesus face to face, and he told us how proud the Father was of us, and we worshiped like we had never worshiped before. Now, kids, give your lives to him. Amen. You know, I still got my, my I still got my fire suit. I can't get in it anymore. I still got it. It's just an old bag and a box in the storage room. I know exactly where it's at. When I preached this sermon or told that story in years past, I used to bring it into the pulpit with me because it's still scorched on the front. The tires shriveled up. You ever spend any time in the furnace? Let me say it like this. If you ever trust God enough to go to the place that looks like it's the end, yeah. it'll mark you for life. You'll never forget that day. You won't want to forget that day. You'll carry that moment with you to your grave. Going to the furnace turned out to be the greatest day of these guys' life. Why? Because God was there. You know, I, I'm going to reiterate this because sometimes I, I want you to hear me tonight. We got to get this full surrender thing down if we're going to have revival. Sometimes, sometimes God delivers people from the furnace. But oftentimes he delivers people in the furnace. That's right. And when he delivers us in the furnace, all oh, that far surpasses him delivering us from the furnace. Yeah. And so what I think is the greatest danger for believers in 21st century American culture or Western culture I think the greatest danger is when the primary goal of life becomes avoiding the furnace. The, the danger is that we pray, God, deliver me from the pain. Deliver me from the hardship. Deliver me from the discomfort and the suffering and the inconvenience. Lord, make my life smooth. Make it easy. Make it comfortable. Remove the obstacles. 
But I surrender, I submit this to you tonight. Dangerous places are the safest places to be when God is there. Amen. And what looks like the safest route is the most dangerous route when God isn't there. That's right. Amen. On the day Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had their deal with Neb, I believe God said to Jesus, Jesus, go meet them boys in the furnace. <laughs> Just go meet them in the furnace. Now let me ask you something. <coughs> what if they hadn't shown up? Mm -hmm. What if in the heat of the moment, they said, man, I'm not taking a knee, man. I want to go home. challenge you to stop asking God for less heat. Stop asking him for easy. Resolve to never ask him for that again. He already knows what your needs are. Stop asking him for more security because ultimately there's no security outside of Christ. Right. And besides, there's something a whole lot greater How often, can we admit this, how often does the human heart, I, I'm, just, I'm, just, I, I'm just telling you like it is, church, I hate it. It, it, it plagues my family, it plagues me, all of us. How often do we allow our hearts to get all bound up in the most trivial, trite things? How dare he? I'm a Christian, I would never let the word how I'm offended. What do you got to be offended about? <laughs> Our life's easier, easier than ninety-five percent of the world. We there, there ain't been a generation or a country on the face of this earth in centuries that's had it as good as we got it. Right. How dare? How dare we speak anything contrary to anybody with what Jesus has provided for us? God help us. Right. God forgive me, God. Forgive me for my spoiled nature. Forgive me for my expectancy for things to go my way. Forgive me for fighting for my own will in the life of the church when it's about the life of Jesus in the life of the church, in the community. Amen. You're here tonight to be revived because you're the church. You're the body of Christ. You're called to be ambassadors of the gospel of Jesus Christ. May we never spend another minute complaining or arguing or fighting or whatever over anything and just get on board with what Jesus is doing. Yep. Somebody cut me off on the freeway. <laughs> Shot me one of those hand gestures. <laughs> you know what I, they do that to me all the time. You know what I do? I try to get up the side and smile. I've seen so many sanctified Nazarenes and faces look like this. <laughs> I've said, I'll stand on your head, learn to stand on your head so the corners of your mouth will point the other way. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, no. Don't you just sometimes get tired of the trivial stuff going on in the American church? I mean, we just don't, don't you just want to love Jesus? Just chase after him, just give your heart and soul and life to him and. And that, that's all Shadrach, Meshach, and Shadrach, Abednego were doing. I didn't get any recognition. I didn't get a raise this year. My boss gave me an angry look. And so what? The fire of the Holy Spirit is realized in deeper measures of devotion. That's where it's realized. So, so I want to ask you, I want to invite you. Here's the invitation. Are you willing to pray a dangerous prayer with me? Man. Do you want revival? Man. Do you really? I want you to stand with me.